I was keeping a class count. I've already forgot. Good morning. It's uh, American Literature Topics in American Literature. America is a mixtape class number X, Y, Z. I've, I've lost count. We're into the week four, week five. We're getting into it, class. Uh, it's February now. It's a new month. Uh, it's almost uh, It's almost the Super Bowl. Uh, today, um, I am really excited to have uh, a writer, a professional writer and, and fellow music fan on, on the call. And I'm just going to read a little bit of his rap sheet here, class. Um, our guest, Mark Camp, is the author of Dixie Lullaby, which could have been the textbook uh, for this class. Here's my copy um, right here. And I'm going to prompt him with his first question uh, right out of this. And I sent you guys a massive PDF file that might, if you had, if you had dial up, it would take you an hour to download <laughs> the PDF that he generously gave me to permission to do. Uh, you should go buy his book. I think it's on Kindle. Um, or uh, uh, you can order a, a used copy, I'm sure, uh, cheaper on Amazon, but it's out there. Um, it's a 21-year-old book, but it's still relevant to everything that we're doing in this class. But he is currently the senior editor at Our State Magazine, which is a, a flagship publication of the state of North Carolina, his home state. But let me just, let me just give you uh, his credentials here just briefly. He's a former editor at the Creative Loafing Magazine in Charlotte, which is like a a free uh, weekly, uh, uh, alt-weekly like we have in Nashville, the Nashville scene. Uh, Mark, I don't know if you know this, I did a brief stint at the Metro Times uh, back in the 90s in, in Detroit. Former editor of the San Francisco Weekly, prominent. Um, I don't know if I've ever asked you if you knew John Houston, a uh, buddy of mine from Michigan, used to work at SF Weekly. Uh, we worked at a record store together in the 80s. Uh, he is a uh, former entertainment editor of the Charlotte Observer. He worked for MTV and Rolling Stone magazine, and he is an English major like me from East Carolina University, and uh, he's from Asheboro, North Carolina. Welcome to the call, Mark Kemp. So the reason, one of the things I'm doing in this class is we're trying to locate our mixtapes and our musical um, uh, inclinations geographically. And like we were doing with Harry Kunzu last week, uh, Harry Smith, Alan Lomax, we've been spending a lot of time trying to understand why Americans are obsessed with Appalachian music, uh, the Mississippi Delta blues music, uh, music located here uh, in the American South where we are we are located. Now, some of us uh, are from here and some of us aren't from here. I'm not from around here. I was raised in the Midwest, but I've made Tennessee my home for longer than anywhere else. I uh, landed here in the mid 1990s and i came to tech in 2001 so this has been my my location for longer uh, contiguously than anywhere else that i've ever lived but when i read mark's book it really helped me make peace and understanding with my adopted home and we're going to be talking a little bit about uh the almond brothers on on wednesday but all of uh rock in, uh, coming out of the south in the 70s had this aspect of healing as a white guy growing up in the South during the time of Martin Luther King Jr. and also the time of like, you know, the Black Panthers and whatever. Mark's just, I, I hate to say, talk about people's age in public, but he's just a, a teeny bit older than me. And, uh, and, and so he was, uh, I was a baby in arms in Chicago uh, when Martin was assassinated. And that's one of the anchors that you start your book with. My dad was in the Illinois National Guard and was actually deployed. And something that he told me uh, many years later was that, none of them had any ammunition. They all had weapons, but they were not given ammunition and they had to get special permission to have ammunition. Um, and I, I wonder how many lives we could save uh, if, uh, if law enforcement officers had to get special permission uh, to, get, to get live ammunition. But that was during the unrest after the assassination of Dr. King um, in 68. And I think that's how my dad avoided Vietnam uh, was uh, by serving in the Illinois National Guard. So that's kind of incredible um, uh, uh, thing uh, alone. But there's this passage in, in, in your book, and you're referring to the Allman Brothers, but this could be referring to what it, would, what it meant to be a music fan in the 70s and to be a little bit counterculture, um, a little bit of a, a, of a hippie. Uh, you say about the Allman Brothers band, but out of Macon, Georgia, if you guys have never heard of them, and they are not on the list I sent you last night, but I'm going to send you a count at three more supplemental lists to the list I sent you yesterday. And I'm working very hard on these lists, uh, way too hard actually, <laughs> but there's going to be a list that has uh, the uh, album Idle Wild South that I was listening to um, this morning to get ready for this call to put me in the mood to ask uh, my, my mentor and friend and, and, and true rock and roll scholar. I, I feel like, uh, did you see almost famous Mark? I can be William Miller and you can be Lester Bangs in that scene 
in Almost Famous. I made him watch one of those scenes last week. So this is what this is what you wrote twenty over twenty years ago. Um, you said this multiracial. This is important because integration was happening in the studios, like in Muscle Shoals and Fame Studios and in Stax Studios in Memphis. So, so um, sometimes right behind integration, that was tense in the schools. Uh, that sometimes you know they they to to for a black student to go to school, they had to be, you know, they had to have security entourage to protect them from. From vandal, um, from uh, um, harassment, and from um, you know people throwing stuff at them. Anyway, so the Allman Brothers Band was a multiracial Southern rock band. Uh, with uh, and actually, the the brothers did a, a stint in Mount Juliet, which is near uh, near Nashville. Here, they went to uh, a military school, but they were actually from Florida um, before that, and they they made their hub in Macon, Georgia. And you can go to Macon and go to the Big House, which I recommend. I've been to the Big House. Anyway, you write, the multiracial outfit of hippies and rednecks created a soundtrack that relieved young Southerners of the weightiness of guilt, fear, and economic insecurity, the family legacy of racism, the drudgery of rural working class existence, the Almond's ambitious mix of musical styles with sonic integration at its purest. For restless young people across the South, this music communicated stuff that could not be learned from books or from teachers, parents, or clergy. The music went straight to the intuitive part of the human soul. So, Mark, if you would, take us in a time machine with you to North Carolina in the 70s. And and they they have, uh, from the preface through page 34, that they can read on their own. So I'm not asking you to, you know, to, to do a reading from the book or anything like that. But just kind of put us in the in the context of, of your context and your upbringing and how, how music spoke to you at that time. And, and maybe you even have some contemporary reference points for them um, about how the music is continuing to be a force for healing and liberation in our time, which is unfortunately, as you and I were talking briefly earlier this morning, as I um, practiced our sound check, that we're fraught with some of the same issues in 2022 that you experienced uh, as a as a as a tween, as a young teenager in the early 70s, uh, and in the late uh, just as a child in the late 60s and as a teenager in the in the 70s, uh, going you know on road trips, going to see bands like Leonard Skinner. So so take us there, Mark. Take us back and uh, and, and and share with uh, our. Uh, we've got oh goodness gracious, more than 30 people on the call that are interested to hear what you have to say this morning. So everyone, welcome to the call. My, my, my dear friend, uh, writer from North Carolina, Mark Kemp. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me to, to speak this morning and good morning, everybody. Um, and yeah, I, um, go, let, let me, let me think just a bit, go back to 12 years old. Uh, I, I started the school in the late sixties. And when I started my hometown ha had not integrated the schools yet. So it was all white uh, until my second grade year. And um, that was when they integrated, uh, they, they closed down the black school in our small hometown. I, I come from a little mill town in North Carolina and they sent the black students over to all the white schools. And, and uh, the one white school that I went to we probably only, you know, that first year, there were only about four or five black students that year. Um, but we didn't really know how to deal with this. I mean, our, the, the whole culture had been segregated, you know, from the time I was born. And, um, you know, we grew up with family members and people in the communities with really antiquated ideas about race. And when the schools were mixed, uh, there wasn't really, you know, nowadays you have tolerance classes or, you know, we learn about tolerance and we learn about different cultures. But back then, uh, it, well, now that's being threatened once again. But in later years, like the 80s and 90s and 2000s, you know, students learned about, you know, multiculturalism and, all, you know, all kinds of things that we didn't have back then. They just kind of said, OK, tomorrow you're going to have black students here. Um, and we didn't really know how to, to deal with that. So we deal, dealt with it as best we could. And in later years, after I got to know, you know, one of my friends from that period was uh, a black kid named Martin and we became really good buddies. Um, and we started listening to music together. And by the time, you know, at, at that time it was like Jackson five and, you know, teeny bopper stuff like that. And that was my favorite group. But by the time I reached about 12 or 13, 
I was introduced to this group called the Allman Brothers Band. And I had listened to other music, you know, that was popular at the time, the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin and stuff like that. But when I heard the Allman Brothers, uh, it was like I had had an epiphany. These people sounded like me. Uh, they looked like the people I grew up around. You know, they dressed in flannels and jeans. And uh, most of the rock stars of that era were real glittery and, and bigger than life. But the Allman Brothers seemed not bigger than life. They were they were very much like next door neighbors. And when they play their music and, and they were an integrated band, which was really super you know, rare in the South at the time, although the one place where integration always was, was in music um, because musicians play together no matter what. So um, the Allman Brothers was, a, they were an integrated band and they mixed all different kinds of music, uh, blues and rock and country uh, and jazz. Uh, and it, it just blew my mind. As, as a child, I learned more by listening to the Allman Brothers and reading about music uh, in magazines than I did from any adult or teacher uh, that, you know, that I grew up with. Uh, and, and there was one song in particular that, that really grabbed me, and that was a song called Dreams. And Dreams, um, in Dreams, the singer Greg Allman uh, expressed a kind of melancholy um, about those times that I had never heard from any other musician in my life. It was very similar to what King had been preaching about, um, going up to the mountain, um, looking down on, on what was going on in society at the time, um, and, and feeling an inner conflict with that, and um, trying to find some sort of higher power, for lack of better words. Um, but, but there were no answers. Like, at that time, one of the big hits uh, on radio was Let It Be by the Beatles. And that provided answers, Let It Be, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the Allman Brothers didn't provide any answers. Uh, they just had questions. Uh, it was a lot more difficult music than just a pop song like Let It Be. So I really gravitated to the Allman Brothers. And as I grew up, um, a lot of other bands started popping up uh, around the South that mixed these Southern uh, musical styles like country and blues and jazz. And um, they, they, they spoke to my generation. Um, some of them, like, you know, you had Leonard Skinner come along later and they were, they expressed an anger about how the South was being per portrayed in the rest of the country. Uh, and, and they rebelled against that. They basically said, you know, how dare you call our area racist when you you know you mr northerner or mr westerner are just as racist you your cultures are just as racist they're just racist in different ways and and you know believe that or not buy it or not it, it was just in the air this this tension was in the air and and when i mixed that you know when i listened to that and then listened to some of the music that my friend martin like turned me on to like funkadelic and uh, Rufus and Chaka Khan, and what was coming out of the black community at that time, um, all that music together provided sort of a healing for those who wanted that. You know, there were a lot of young people who, who uh, still like kind of bought into their parents' racism, but there was a little group of us uh, who grew up in this small town uh, using music as sort of a roadmap to navigate this new cultural truth terrain that had never before existed in this country. This country had been segregated from, you know, from the, the get-go, you know. And so now we were navigating a new culture that was not segregated, and music really helped us get through that. Uh, and the Allman Brothers, in particular, uh, was really important, man. In that did, regard. You, did you get backlash from family or friends or or, or classmates uh, either in high school or college for uh, flying your freak flag, if you will, or was it did it become main mainstream as far as like the fashion? My understanding, and, and I'm going to introduce the class later on in the semester to some people from Cookville who were at Tennessee Tech in like '68 who were quote flower children. Um, did you find that um, that did you embrace the whole counterculture? 
identity at that time as well. So you're like, you graduated from high school in 70 ish. Eight. <laughs> yeah, 78. So, so, so by, by that time, were, were, was your whole high school like bell bottoms and, you know, uh, ripped jeans and no, no, not, not the whole school. I mean, did you, know, you get in trouble? Like, did you ever get in trouble or did you ever get bullied or? Yes. Big time. Big time. Cause I had my hair long, uh, really early. I mean, really early like when i was nine or ten i had really long blonde hair and i looked like a girl and so uh i got a lot of bullying for looking like a girl for one thing but also um yeah also for the music because there were you know just like there is now with young kids there were groups and there were the you know there were the jocks over here there were the hippies over here i was a hippie um there were uh, the rednecks, you know, uh, who tended to be more racist, uh, they were the popular kids. You know, I mean, it, it just just like there is now, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, and then from the uh, the adults, you know, it just depended. You know, my my parents were fairly progressive for the times. Um, there were pre people in my hometown that who were more progressive, but not very many because this is a very 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 conservative uh, part of the North Carolina. So most of the adults were, yeah, they were not into what my group was listening to or doing, or, you know, there were, you know, I had a lot of black friends and there were words said about me and my group, uh, the uh, in lovers, you know, I mean, that, that was, that was a thing back then. And it was really intense. It could be intense in, uh, in my, um, I guess eighth grade year, there was a race riot at our school, but there, there weren't the, uh, the population, the, the population of people of color in my hometown was very small. So it wasn't like a riot like you'd have in Detroit, <laughs> but um, it was a riot and it, it had to call the cops in and split up, you know, the groups of people. And my friends and I, you know, just decided to lay out of school that day that it got super intense because we did you know we didn't take sides in this thing um so when yeah you, i mean it was a it was a it was a, a turbulent time what when did you notice that this uh i've got kind of two threads one is when did you notice that this was possibly going to be uh you were going to professionalize music fandom as a as a as a journalist and, and and I think, to be honest with you, I think journalists seemed like a much more viable career then than it does now. Now, I, I mentioned when I wrote for the Metro Times, I was an undergraduate, but they were paying me pennies. And it was like 10 cents a word. And it was, I mean, I scrounged, I, I, I hustled and scrounged and maybe earned like $7,000, you know, freelancing one year. And I thought I, thought I was a king. But you know what $7,000 a year can buy you these days was which isn't much. So you're going to college in this period. And then of course, you know, punk happens. And then of course, I mean, and they won't relate to this, but you and I will, but REM happens, you know, Michael Stipe right. and REM and Peter Buck happens to us. Cause I was, I was there, like I was in high school by that time you're in college. I mean, I, I remember, you know, uh, when MTV started playing REM and U2 and then when, when that all happened to us, but when did you get the inkling that uh, music journalism was going to be your calling? And then also how did it, you imply in the pages that I've, I've sent to them uh, through a meeting with my friend, Mike Ferris, by the way, who I produced a show for uh, at Tech several years ago, and he won a Grammy for, for, for gospel a couple of years ago, for Roots Gospel a couple of years ago. But uh, you're going to see the screaming sheet of Willie's, but you, you imply that there was, you, you almost had to sort of hide your Southern credentials. You kind of didn't you, you didn't want to fully own your lineage and that this book, it seems to me from your introduction, Mark, is your reckoning, your coming home, your homecoming, your ability to, to make peace with yourself around who you are and what you're, and, and, and to be proud of your lineage and to speak for others. Because just as somebody who's an adopted Southerner, and I call myself, I don't think I told you this yet, I call myself a Yankabilly. You know, I'm a hybrid, a hybrid, mixed, mixed marriage. I, I married a lady with a real thick drawl who grew up in East Tennessee and was, and was born in Texas. So, and, and, and we, we watch the Vols games now here, just like, you know, the, you do at your house, you know, there's a few things I've had to assimilate, you know? So, so when you, when you were, were exported to San Francisco and New York and the scene 
the alternative hip hip scene of the eighties and nineties. Like, so so getting your calling as a journalist, and then and then the extent to which you uh, sort of hid your southernness until until around the time that this book emerges. I think you say you wrote a piece for the New York Times where you kind of you kind of came out as a southerner. <laughs> you know, talk about that a little bit. Those that's two questions, and I, I didn't phrase it as best as I could. That's, I that's okay. I kind of hear where you're coming from. I um. I knew I wanted to write for Rolling Stone from the time I was about 12 years old. I was reading Rolling Stone and Cream um, instead of my school books. <laughs> and um, I, I knew that I either wanted to be a rock star or I wanted to write about music and really writing. You know, I did both. I mean, I played music, but um, I really loved music and I didn't want to get just kind of pigeonholed into one kind of music, which is what you do if you're, you know, in a band usually. Um, so I chose the route of writing about music and then I decided to major in English and st I studied philosophy and journalism uh, as minors. Um, so I knew exactly what I wanted to do from the time I was 12. And so what I did is I, uh, I got a job at a newspaper after I got out of college and I wrote about crime and stuff like that that I was supposed to write about. But I, then I also wrote about music. And uh, I was in Burlington, North Carolina, and the manager for REM's mother was a state senator there. And so I got to know him, and I, I already loved REM. They were very underground at the time. And um, just kind of, I started writing about REM for our newspaper on the side. And uh, I had, because I had a plan, you know, I knew exactly what I was doing. Uh, at, at one point, I decided I can't you know, I tried to write for Rolling Stone from North Carolina. This was back in the mid, early to mid eighties. And, you know, they were like, you know, back then you didn't have email or text or anything like that. You had to write a letter and send it off to New York and wait about a month to get a letter back. <laughs> I can't even imagine that waiting a month to get a reply. But, uh, and, you know, they were saying, yeah, nice uh, young man down there in North Carolina, but we don't need you. Um, and I went to a thing called the New Music Seminar in New York in the late 80s, about 86, and I uh, talked to some people who were in the business, in the music journalism business. I said, I want to do this. How do I do it? And they said, well, you really have to move to New York if you want to do this, because it's just the way it's done. you know. And, and back then it was. Nowadays, you can do things from anywhere. So I either had to move to Los Angeles or New York or San Francisco. So I moved to New York in the late 80s and started writing about music. Uh, I got to know people there, and I started writing about music with my plan being to eventually land at Rolling Stone. But first, um, I, uh, I, it, by that time, I was really into hip hop and, and punk rock. And um, I'd moved on from my Southern roots, and I was kind of ashamed of my Southern roots. And all I wanted to do is listen to, you know, Public Enemy and Stetsasonic and Salt and Peppa and uh, Minor Threat and Sonic Youth and these kinds of uh, artists. And they were huge in New York at the time. So I got an opportunity to write for a magazine that was based in Los Angeles and that focused on alternative music. And back then, alternative music was really underground rather than this mainstream thing. Um, and Rolling Stone didn't write about a lot of this music. So I started writing about this kind of music for option out in los angeles and um when their editor stepped down uh the publisher asked me if i would be interested in coming and editing option and i was thrilled because this was kind of the cool magazine at that time uh, a lot cooler than rolling stone although i eventually wanted to end up at rolling stone and i eventually did but so in the 90s i spent most of my time in los angeles you know, um, we covered the rise of Nirvana and uh, we put, you know, De La Soul and Ice T on the Ice T back before he was mainstream. We put him on the cover of Option and uh, we covered a lot of the electronic dance music that was coming around at that time. And it was super, super exciting. But yeah, I did not. My southern roots at that point were as far away from me as I, you know, as they could possibly be. You know, I didn't. I never in my wildest imagination thought I would 
move back to the South because I had left the South, one, to be in New York so I could write about music, and two, to get away from what I thought was, you know, just the worst racism, you know, around. I was sick of it. I was sick and tired of the racism that I got in the uh, in the sheriff's department, in the, you know, the county government offices. It was everywhere in the, you know, county commissioners meetings, all that stuff that I covered as a reporter, everywhere I went, you know, just racism was just at, at a high pitch level. Um, and I was done with it. I was tired of it. Um, and I never thought I would come back. But I also learned that when I moved to New York and LA, that racism exists there. Um, but do it to a different degree than it does here. Um, so yeah, it wasn't until I, you know, I was back in New York, I was editing Rolling Stone in the 90s, I had, I think, just moved over to MTV. Uh, and I was doing some writing for New York Times. And I went to see this band at this place called Wetlands in New York called the Screaming Cheetah Wheelies, who uh, Andrew just mentioned. And I got down there and I noticed that, you know, when I was talking to these guys, it was members of the Cheetah Wheelies and members of this band called Government Mule and members of the Allman Brothers. Um, my childhood heroes, you know, and I got back there and I was talking to them and I noticed that my Southern accents just started coming out a little bit more. And I, you know, and I went, wow, this is interesting. <laughs> I haven't heard my Southern accent to this extent in a long, long time. And I wrote a piece for the New York Times about how, um, you know, Southerners sometimes will um, kind of relax and be themselves when they're around each other. But when we're in a in company of, of people from the Northeast, um, a lot of times we hide our Southern identities because it's seen as stupid, you know, oftentimes. Um, not by everybody and not all the time, but sometimes that's how it's seen. So I just did a think piece on that and using this experience at this club with these bands uh, as a launching point to talk about something bigger. And fast forward a couple of years later, and I, was, I uh, a girlfriend of mine was saying, when are you going to write your book? And I, I said, I don't really know what I'm going to write about. And uh, But it dawned on me one day that I said, maybe I'll write about that thing, that, that Southern thing. And right about that same time, speaking of that Southern thing, a band out of Athens, Georgia, came out called Drive By Truckers. And they were thinking in terms the same terms that I was thinking in, uh, they had just recorded this album called Southern Rock Opera, where uh, the uh, the leader of that band, um, Patterson Hood, was exploring the very same issues of race and identity, and uh, that that dichotomy of, uh, you know, am I proud of being a Southerner or am I ashamed of being a Southerner sort of thing. So it really dovetailed well uh, with with what I was thinking of writing about in my book. Uh, and, and to top it off, Patterson Hood, the guy in Drive-By Truckers, his father played with like um, the staple singers and all these soul groups back in the 60s. So it was kind of a full circle thing. And I felt like that would make a good story, a good historical story, a good cultural story, and a good musical story. And that's, that's how I got to writing Dixie Lullaby. Everybody, I met Mark by basically fanboy friending him on Facebook and then just stalking the heck out of him. And we started collaborating a year ago around contemporary Black artists that are in the genres of country uh, and Americana. And so we're both huge fans of Rhiannon Giddens and Amethyst Kia and Joy Oladukun. And we started really, you know, kind of working this, you know, um, this aspect, both in what what he's pr promoting on his page and the and stuff I play out like on my radio show, and 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 seeing the collapsing of these of these genres. But one of the things that you uh, mentioned just in passing, but is one thing that I don't think I've told them yet on the class. And if you have any uh, any wisdom on this t on this tip, Mark, I'd love for you to share it. We don't we don't. It's not a new thing. Well, first of all, there was like Ray Charles and you know, uh, J Johnny Mathis. And, and of course they all like the Darius Rucker version of, uh, of wagon wheel better than the old crow medicine show version of wagon wheel. And, and so, so there, 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 there's always been African Americans in, um, in, in, in country music. 
but there is something happening now that it's at a whole nother at a whole nother level. But you tell the story about Arnie Schultz and Bill Monroe. Do you remember that mm -hmm. story? So oh, yeah. So going back to the stuff we were talking about with Alan Lomax and Harry Smith, and I and I tried to do this already because we did kind of, and they're probably really ready to get to the 21st or the late 20th. They're probably glad when I sent them that list last night that it has a lot of 20th, late 20th and early 20th, because I have been very old timing these last couple of weeks, but I don't think I ever mentioned this piece. The, the, the invention of bluegrass was interracial is basically, just like the Allman Brothers was interracial. So what is it like? The banjo comes from an African instrument. Africa. Mm -hmm. So, so already you had these uh, these collaborations, um, but uh, I mean, I many, many years before that. I mean, country music is African American music, and that's the big lie: is that country music somehow isn't. It is African American, just like rock and roll. You know, every, pretty much all the all the great American music, jazz, country rock and roll, blues, all of that is all African-American music, period. And we inhabit it as, as guests and, 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 and there's hospitality. That's the thing that I don't understand about the dynamic of what we're dealing with. And I've alluded to it with the class and I don't wanna, I don't wanna go off on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a tangent with them. Um, I've been trying to restrain myself from doing, from doing that, but, but we're having to re we're having to redo conversations that we've been having now for 75 years, yes. you know, to remind people that this, that this collaborative nature has been presented to, to most, uh, to what, to white activists through, through Dr. King and his work with SCLC, but also uh, to white music fans through, um, you know, Chuck Berry and Little Richard. And then, you know, later, of course, with the Almond Bros, but, but even, even the Stones, and I've got issues, bad issues with the Stones, and they're off limits, guys, they're British, we're, we're not touching them. But, you know, they did bring, you know, black artists, you know, to open for them. You know, um, I, I remember the, I saw them in 82 on, 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 uh, on Tattoo You, and it was Etta James, you know, and I didn't understand, I was, I was 14, I didn't understand that, that, you know, even though I've been brought up in, a, in an integrated community in Cleveland and then and then Detroit, I didn't understand that Etta James was there for a reason. You know, that was just what we had to sit through before we could hear them hear that riff that opens start me up, you know. And so I, I could get the T-shirt to wear to school the next day. So everybody, you know, in my class at junior high knew I'd been at the Stones concert the night before. I just looked at the time. Oh, my gosh, class time flies on this call every day. It's only a 50 minute class. So um Mark, what would you, um, because I've given you, and they've, they're a really good audience. I know they're listening intently. Um, what would you want them uh, to know about themselves? You know, like, you know, you're kind of like an, um, an adopted uncle to them today, everybody. You know, this is Uncle Mark. I'm like, you know, these are your <laughs> adopted uh, 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 kin in the Cookville community many of them are, are from the southeast some of them are not from the southeast but a majority of our students come from Chattanooga, Asheville, Murfreesboro and all the little small towns like you know Birdstown and Sparta and just the the surround you know uh, Crossville the surrounding areas and, and and this is very much like what you describe uh, your upbringing to be like uh, majority white community where majority white institution Tennessee Tech is a very small minority population and um, and I and I've by the luck of them signing up from this class, I've kind of thrown them into this question, you know, for the duration of the semester to to lean into this project of loving music as a as a tool of healing. What's one last thing they would like them to know? And then I'm going to open it up for the last couple of minutes for them to drop questions. And they'll probably drop them in the chat, which is what they normally do. But I want to leave a couple of minutes for them to interact with you um, directly. And so I'll, I'll step out of my MC role and I'll, I'll, I'll pause the recording. But your, your last shot, what would you like these young? And I, I tell them that they're all music scholars, whether they want to be or not. So they're, they're all younger versions of me and you for at least for the remaining 10 weeks I've got them in this class. What, what would you like them to take away um, uh, from this, this moment being young music fans in the, in the Southeast? I mean, you know, I was a massive music fan, a music geek, but then so many of my friends were also into music, you know, even if they weren't quite as heavily as I was. So if you're like them or if you're like me, you know, I mean, just explore music, really, you really dig down to the deepest, deepest roots of, of what you like and, and see what you find there. There's, you know, there's, 
there's so much more to music than what's going on right now on the pop charts or what's being streamed the most or whatever. You know, there's so much behind that. There's so much richness behind that that's that's built up to this moment where you have a Kendrick Lamar or whatever. You know, you, you there's so much back there. And to truly understand what uh, Kendrick Lamar is doing, or I'm just using his name because I like him a lot, but you, you, you got to go back those tributaries all the way back or, or some country uh, musician that you're into Darius Rucker or whatever, you know, you, you, you know, to, to really, to really understand the import of that music, you know, we need to go back and, and, you know, Andrew was talking just a second ago about the sharing, you know, I, I said, you know, country music is African-American music. Well, it is. But a lot of our music is also the sharing but among the cultures. Some of the some of the music now that we listen to is sharing among African-American Latinos in white culture. You know, that's how Latino influence in music is coming more to the fore uh, of a lot of music now, particularly here in the South. Before, it always been out in California and Texas. Um, but there's so many deep, beautiful roots to this stuff that we listen to now. Um, I would say just really explore that.